Hello everyone, kamusta? I hope you're all doing fine. Welcome back to the channel. This is Daos of Law and I'm attorney Al Jumrani. So, today's video is about marriage, marriage license, and mixed marriages. By the way, I'd like to thank everyone who has watched and who continue to watch my videos, uh, who have subscribed to my channel. And if you are new to the channel, I am attorney Al. I make videos about the law, about law subjects, and about law related issues. And on the side, I make travel videos. So if you're enjoying your stay here, please consider subscribing to my channel to support me and click that notification bell so that you will be notified in case I upload a new video. So again, this video is about marriage, marriage license, and mixed marriages. This video would be helpful to first-year law students, um, fourth-year law students who take up uh, Civil Law Review 1, and of course, our bar review is. So I hope you will learn something from this video. But before we begin, I have some questions that I'd like us to ponder and hopefully they can be guides in understanding the law on marriage, marriage license, and mixed marriages. So let's uh, start with the first question. So the first question is that if marriage is statutorily defined and regulated, can the legislature then change the nature and dynamics of marriage, like allowing divorce? even if that goes against tradition, norms, and religious beliefs? Next question. With the present COVID-19 pandemic, where video conferencing has substituted most face-to-face -face activities like meetings, classes, and even court hearings, can we not allow a marriage ceremony through video conferencing? Next. If an 18-year-old has legal capacity, including the capacity to enter into onerous contracts like sales, loans, and mortgages, why does an 18-year-old need a parental consent or a 21-year-old need parental advice just to marry? Isn't this an unwarranted restriction on legal capacity? Now, last question is, why do people fall in love? Why do they fall out of love? Why do people marry? And why do they want to unmarry? Does the law have the answers to these questions? What do you think? Well, I'll share my thoughts at the end of the video on these questions. Okay, so let's begin with the lecture. So what is marriage? Article 1 of the Family Code defines marriage as a special contract of permanent union between a man and a woman entered into in accordance with law for the establishment of conjugal and family life. It is the foundation of the family and an inviolable social institution whose nature, consequences, and incidents are governed by law and not subject to stipulation, except that marriage settlements may fix the property relations during the marriage within the limits provided for by this code. So what are the points to remember from this definition? Well, first, it is a special contract. Next, it is a permanent union. Third, it is a union between a man and a woman. Fourth, it is a union entered in accordance with law. And fifth, its purpose is to establish conjugal and family life. Let's understand these points better. As a special contract, marriage is not the same as ordinary contracts in so far as its creation, consummation, and consequences are concerned. Thus, it cannot be formed by implication or estoppel. It does not require a particular form for its validity. And the freedom to contract or autonomy of parties does not apply in marriage. Now, as a permanent union, marriage is meant to last till death do us part. It is not a contract for a particular or temporary purpose. The parties cannot also stipulate an expiration date. And also, it cannot be terminated except for reasons provided for by law such as death, annulment, or nullity of marriage. As a union between a man and a woman, only a man and a woman can enter a marriage. Same-sex marriage is not allowed. It cannot even be made between persons of the same sex, 
one of whom has undergone sexual reassignment. We'll learn more about this in the case of Silverio versus Republic. Now, as a union entered in accordance with law, its nature, consequences, and incidents are governed by law and not subject to stipulation. Except for marriage settlements, the parties cannot contract away their rights and obligations. Any change or modification in the aspects of marriage, such as property relations, support, and parental authority, must be through a court order or a judicial decree. Next, as a union whose purpose is to establish conjugal and family life, the cause of the parties to a marriage is not monetary or proprietary gain. The parties must live together, observe mutual love, respect, and fidelity. Now, if they have children, the parties must jointly exercise parental authority and provide support. So those are just some of the features related to the characteristic of a marriage as a union whose purpose is to establish a conjugal and family life. Now, what have been the challenges against the legal concept of marriage? Let's first look at the case of Silveria versus Republic. This was decided back in October 22, 2007. So here the Supreme Court said that the sex of a person is determined at birth, visually done by the birth attendant, either the physician or midwife, by examining the genitals of the infant. Considering that there is no law legally recognizing sex reassignment, the determination of a person's sex made at the time of his or her birth, if not attended by error, is immutable. While petitioner have succeeded in altering his body and appearance through the intervention of modern surgery, no law authorizes the change of entry as to sex in the civil registry for that reason. Thus, there is no legal basis for his petition for the correction or change of the entries in his birth certificate. Now, this is the most important part of the decision. To grant the changes sought by petitioner will substantially reconfigure and greatly alter the laws on marriage and family relations. It will allow the union of a man with another man who has undergone sex reassignment. In other words, a male to female post-operative transsexual. So if you will remember this case, here Rommel filed an action for change of name and sex in his birth certificate from Rommel to Meli and from male to female claiming that he has gone sexual reassignment. So as already discussed, the Supreme Court denied that petition. Now the next case is Falsis versus Civil Registrar General, which is relatively new, around two years ago. So here the petitioner sought the amendment of Article 1 of the Family Code on the definition of marriage. However, the Supreme Court denied the petition and held that that would be arrogating legislative power. In other words, the Supreme Court advised the petitioner to bring his issue about the alleged discriminatory effect of Article 1 of the Family Code to the legislative branch of the government by proposing an amendment of Article 1 of the Family Code in order to eradicate the very strict definition of marriage by limiting it to only a couple composed of a man and a woman. Okay, so that was the ruling of the Supreme Court and I think that ruling cements our uh, our idea that you know in this jurisdiction a marriage is only between a man and a woman. It has to you know have a legislative amendment okay, to make marriage available for same sex couples. Unlike in other jurisdictions where there is no definition of marriage you know, a mere invocation of the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution allowed or made same-sex marriage possible. Okay, now let's talk about legal presumptions in favor of marriage. So first is in favor of the existence of marriage. So if there is doubt whether or not uh, a couple had in fact been married, then the doubt will be resolved in favor of marriage. And uh, the party who claims that there was no marriage has the burden of proving that, in fact, there was no marriage celebrated between the two parties. Okay. 
Next is in favor of the validity of marriage. What does this mean? Well, it means that if uh, two theories have been advanced, one in support of the validity of the marriage and the other um, suggesting that the marriage is void, then the doubt or the conflict will be resolved in favor of the validity of the marriage. And he who claims that the marriage is void must prove okay, that claim okay, by convincing and sufficient evidence. Now, lastly, uh, we have the presumption that persons living together are presumed to be married. Now, he who claims that they are not married and that they are only common law spouses okay, has the burden of showing that, in fact, there was no marriage celebrated between the parties. Okay, so that's how uh, the law prefers uh, the existence as well as the validity of marriage. Now, the due existence of marriage is not affected by the following. First, the failure of the parties to sign the marriage certificate. So even if one or both parties fail to sign the marriage certificate, the marriage is still valid and is deemed to have been celebrated, notwithstanding that the marriage certificate had not been signed. For after all, a marriage certificate is merely proof or evidence of the marriage. It's not the marriage itself. Now next uh, is that the due existence of marriage is not affected by the failure of the solemnizing officer to transmit copies of the marriage certificate. Indeed, it is the duty of the solemnizing officer to transmit uh, the duplicate or I think it's the triplicate copy of the marriage certificate to the local civil registrar. Now, if the solemnizing officer failed to uh, submit that or to file that, that doesn't affect the validity of the marriage or the existence of the marriage. The fact is the marriage was still celebrated. Uh, the couple or the parties took each other as husband and wife. So the, the transmission of that uh, marriage certificate is only a confirmation or an act for purposes of registering or recording what transpired during the marriage ceremony. Now lastly, uh, the due existence of marriage is not affected by the absence of a marriage certificate in the public records. Now, I know of some people who uh, whose marriage was not recorded. In fact, uh, they had to personally and, uh, manu and and physically submit a copy of the marriage certificate. Now, the validity of the marriage was not affected by the fact that there was no record with the local civil registrar or the Philippine Statistics uh, Authority. Uh, the recording would retroact, okay, of course, to the date of the celebration of the marriage. Okay, so I hope that's clear. You know, marriage is different and independent of the recording. The marriage is also different and separate from the uh, physical paper or what we call the uh, marriage certificate. Okay, so there. Now, here's a problem. Faye and Mark were married before a priest in 1995. The marriage, however, was not registered with the National Statistics Office, now the Philippine Statistics Authority. Faye and Mark fought constantly and in 2005, they decided to separate. Faye applied for work in Dubai and was able to secure a certificate of no marriage record or a senomar. She also found an Egyptian boyfriend whom she loved so much. Is the marriage of Faye and Mark in existence since the NSO has no record of the same? Okay, we have already said that the due existence of the marriage is not affected by the absence of a marriage certificate or of a uh, of an entry or record with the public uh, offices such as the uh, Philippine Statistics Authority. So clearly, the answer is no. The marriage is not in existence. While the marriage certificate is the best evidence of the marriage, the fact of marriage may be proved by other evidence like pictures and testimonies of those who attended the wedding. Okay, The marriage, again, is different from the marriage certificate. Okay, It is the marriage that you know, bonds or binds okay, two people. The marriage certificate is merely a confirmation or an evidence of that bond. All right. Now, let's talk about the requisites of marriage. So, there are two classes of requisites. We have the essential requisites and the formal requisites. But all these are requisites of marriage. So, they must be present 
okay, um, so that the marriage can be considered valid. So what are the essential requisites? We have legal capacity of the parties who must be uh, a man and a woman and also consent freely given okay, before the solemnizing officer. Meanwhile, the formal requisites are the authority of the solemnizing officer, a valid marriage license, and of course, the marriage ceremony. So if you are uh, studying for law school or for the bar, please memorize these five requisites. Okay, but of course, be sure to distinguish which ones are essential requisites and which ones are formal requisites, especially when we talk, when we will talk about later about um, mixed marriages and of course when we talk about voidable and void marriages okay in in another video uh, these distinctions will come in very very handy all right now let's talk about these requisites let's begin with the essential requisites so first up is legal capacity so on legal capacity each party must be at least 18 years old now, before the Family Code and before Republic Act 6809, meaning to say, under the Civil Code uh, regime, a woman aged 14 or a man aged 16 may already contract marriage. That's why a minor can be emancipated by marriage. And if a minor is emancipated by marriage, he thus acquires uh, legal capacity. But, of course, that was the old law. Under the present law, the age of majority is 18, it's also the age of legal capacity, and finally, it is also the age for marriage. So, a party to a contract of marriage has legal capacity if he is at least 18 years old. Now, next, the parties must be a man and a woman. Okay. Again, this is because of Article 1 of the Family Code which states that marriage is a union exclusively of a man and a woman all right next there must be no legal impediment like family relations or a subsisting prior marriage now if the parties are closely related for example ascendants and descendants or siblings whether of the full or half blood the marriage is void for being incestuous all right now if one or both parties are already married the marriage is void for being Bigamous. All right. Now the specific articles are of course provided there uh, for incestuous marriages. We have Article Thirty Seven of the Family Code, and for bigamous marriages, we have Article Thirty Five of the Family Code. Now let's talk about consent. The consent must be freely given and not obtained through duress or fraud. That's why shotgun marriages are not considered valid. No. Now, if the consent is vitiated, the marriage is voidable. The law on the matter is Article 45 of the Family Code. Now, if there is a mistake by one party as to the identity of the other party, like, example, uh, the a groom thought that he was marrying, let's say, Anna, but then turns out uh, the girl before him or with him uh, before the altar is actually Elsa now they look the same because they're twins but of course they're not twins in Frozen but let's assume that in this problem they are they are twins and so there was a mistake and uh, in that case it's not just a vitiation of consent but it is lack of consent because the groom consented to marry someone who is different from the person whom he intended to marry okay so in that case that marriage because of mistake as to the identity of the other party that marriage is void okay now lastly the consent must be given in the presence of the solemnizing officer okay next on the authority of the solemnizing officer take note of the following persons who may solemnize a marriage first is any incumbent member of the judiciary within the court's jurisdiction so when you say member of the judiciary these are judges okay judges duly appointed um, uh, by the president okay from from the uh, short list provided by the judicial and bar council which is of course attached to the supreme court 
Now, there are two types of judges. We have uh, trial court or lower court judges and, of course, the appellate court judges. The lower courts are the regional trial courts, the metropolitan trial courts, and the municipal trial courts. Of course, included under the municipal trial courts are the municipal circuit trial courts and the municipal trial courts in cities. Now, for appellate courts, we have, of course, the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals, the Sandigan Bayan, and the Court of Tax Appeals. Now, an appellate court justice may solemnize marriage anywhere in the Philippines because the court's jurisdiction is, of course, nationwide. Uh, of course, let's not make a you know, hair-splitting distinction when it comes to the Court of Appeals. We know that the Court of Appeals has three stations. Manila, Cebu, and Cagayan de Oro. But, of course, a justice of the Court of Appeals, regardless of his station, is still considered an appellate court justice and thus he can uh, officiate or solemnize marriage anywhere in the Philippines. A trial court judge, however, may solemnize marriage only within his respective jurisdiction. So, for example, a regional trial court judge of Manila can only officiate or solemnize a marriage in Manila. Um, but if that judge is a pairing judge or an acting judge in a different jurisdiction, let's say he is also assigned in the regional trial court of um, Morong Rizal, then he can also um, officiate or solemnize marriage in Rizal. Okay? So what is important is that that trial court judge must or should officiate marriage only in a place where his court has jurisdiction okay now the other set of uh, persons who can solemnize a marriage is of course composed of the priest rabbi imam or minister of any church or religious sect provided that first the priest rabbi imam or minister is duly authorized by his church or religious sect and acts within the limits of such written authority. Now, next, the priest is registered with the civil registrar general. Of course, the civil registrar general, of course, is also the head of the Philippine Statistics Authority. And lastly, at least one of the contracting parties belongs to the solemnizing officer's church or religious sect. So, let's say, for example, we have a couple the guy is Roman Catholic and the girl is, let's say, uh, a member of a born-again church. Now, they can both be married by by a, what to call them, um, minister, okay? even though uh, only one of them, meaning to say the girl, is a member of that born-again church. They don't have to belong to the same church. And in fact, the law does not require the conversion of one party okay, to the religion of the other party. The law does not require that both of them should be a member of the same sect or um, religious group. All right. Also, a ship captain or airplane chief can officiate or solemnize a marriage, provided that the marriage is in articulo mortis, or what we call at the point of death, Okay, where let's say the plane or ship is about or the place about to crash and the ship is about to sink and there is a fear that uh, they will die or even if for example the ship or the plane is not about to sink or uh, crash but both of them for example are at the point of death or just one of them is like terribly terribly sick so they can be um, married by the ship captain or the airplane chief okay so that's of course a question of fact so uh, there should be a fear of death now if they live after the marriage the marriage is not affected what is important is that the factual circumstance must be present at the time of the celebration of the marriage it doesn't matter if they survived and if they ended you know living many more years after the said marriage okay next is that the marriage is between passengers or crew members and lastly, the marriage is performed while the ship is at sea or the plane is in flight or during stopovers at ports of call. Okay? Well, it's good that they would survive. No? At least they would be able to enjoy life together as husband and wife. Because what's the, uh, the fun in marriage when 
you know they will just die after getting married okay but you know there's always this belief that there is life after death so they could still be together after death if you believe in that okay next any military commander of a unit provided that the marriage is in articulo mortis the marriage is performed during a military operation the marriage is between persons within the zone of military operation whether members of the armed forces or civilians the military commander is a commissioned officer and the chaplain assigned to the military unit is absent okay i just want to point out the last uh, part which states that the chaplain assigned to the military unit is absent so in other words when uh, the marriage is uh, to be celebrated uh, during a military operation at a military zone then the preferred person to solemnize the marriage should be the chaplain but in his absence a military commander of a unit may officiate or solemnize the marriage of course provided that the other um, the other requisites are also present okay but if you ask me I mean, why would you marry in the middle of a war all right but of course you know uh, hope is eternal love is romantic and dramatic so it will allow them to marry uh, of course the military commander would allow them to marry okay while uh, shots are fired and all that okay next any consul general consul or vice consul of the philippines in marriages between filipino citizens abroad okay take note of that very important qualification that these filipinos are married abroad so a consul general a consul or vice consul in the philippines okay uh, cannot solemnize or officiate a marriage in the philippines okay his authority to solemnize a marriage is limited to okay the place where he is assigned as a consul uh, consul general or vice consul okay when the marriage is uh, to be celebrated here in the philippines there are more appropriate persons to uh, to invite or to uh, get in order to solemnize or officiate that marriage now lastly a municipal or city mayor and this authority is not provided by the family code but by the local government code but just like <coughs> the a restriction imposed on judges about jurisdiction so a municipal or city mayor can only uh, officiate a marriage within his of course jurisdiction and that is within his city okay now note marriages solemnized by persons without authority are void okay because in other words there is an absence of that uh, formal requisite of you know authority of the solemnizing officer however there's an exception and the exception is that when the parties were in good faith believing that the solemnizing officer had authority so for example it was an impostor uh, this impostor pretended to be a priest or to be a pastor or a minister but it turns out he was neither okay now if uh, the uh, parties had believed in good faith that he is in fact or that he was in fact a priest okay a pastor or a minister then that marriage is of course valid now if however they knew that he had no authority the marriage is void they cannot you know benefit from that uh, lack of uh, authority okay so because they were guilty of bad faith or they knew that this person had no authority then uh, that marriage will be considered void next if the solemnizing officer out acted outside of his jurisdiction the marriage is not void Okay, rather it is a mere irregularity which renders the solemnizing officer administratively liable so for example a judge who uh, solemnizes a marriage outside of his territorial jurisdiction may be held administratively liable by of course the supreme court because that would be uh, exceeding his authority um, but of course later on we will talk about uh, the exception and that would refer to you know the marriage ceremony being held outside okay the place of the office or uh, the place where the solemnizing officer occasionally or habitually discharges or performs his tasks and functions 
Okay? Now, on the marriage ceremony, no prescribed form or religious rites for the solemnization of the marriage is required. So it can be a simple civil wedding or it can be a religious wedding. Both types of weddings are valid. Now, what are the requirements when it comes to marriage ceremony? So first, the parties must appear personally before the solemnizing officer. Okay, personally. Okay, not through uh, an agent, not through a proxy, but they should be themselves personally stand before the solemnizing officer in marriage. Now, the parties must declare that they take each other as husband and wife. Okay, that's why they will be asked, do you, Juan, take Maria as your lawfully wedded wife? And then, of course, uh, he had to say yes. And, of course, Maria will be asked the same question. Do you, Maria, take Juan as your lawfully wedded husband? So, they have to declare to take each other as husband and wife before the solemnizing officer. And, last, the declaration must be the presence of at least two witnesses. So, you see, dalawang, ninong, dalawang witnesses lang kailangan. In other words, one, uh, one ninong and one ninang. But, you know... Uh, you only marry once, ideally. Okay, so uh, get uh, get as many ninong seninangs as you can, or as many ninong seninangs who are available, or as many ninong seninangs who are, you know, financially able. <laughs> All right. Okay. Next, the marriage shall be solemnized publicly in the chambers of the judge, or in open court, or in church chapel or temple or in the office of the consul or mayor now in the following instances the marriage may be solemnized in a different venue okay. so marriage in case of marriage on the point of death or in articulo mortis okay so but then we we only have two instances when um when uh, a ship captain or when when a person other than uh the usual solemnized officers may solemnize a marriage which are of course the uh, ship captain or the airline pilot as well as the head of a military unit okay so they are not really assigned to a specific office so their office is virtually the ship or the uh, airline or the airplane as well as of course the uh, military unit so, I don't know why this is included here, but uh, it only shows that a marriage may, may be celebrated outside of the usual venues of the church or of uh, uh, a court or of a chamber of a judge or an office of a mayor or a consul. Okay? So, a marriage can also be done um, several or you know, hundreds of kilometers up in the air or, you know, in in the battlefield okay so that's what uh, this means next marriage in remote places where there is no means of transportation so here this one is a more uh, realistic uh, exception because here uh, the solemnizing officer may be invited okay to go to okay the place to this remote place where the couple is uh, located or are located now lastly upon request in writing of the parties now this is the more common um, venue or the, the, the more common situation where um, uh, the couple would invite the officiating officer okay, to officiate or solemnize the marriage at a restaurant, at a resort, or at a, a function hall. Okay, So uh, that would be allowed provided again that the solemnizing officer is officiating or has jurisdiction over the place uh, where the marriage is to be celebrated so for example a city mayor must um, must solemnize the marriage at a restaurant or at a uh, venue within his city okay he cannot be invited to a different city and officiate the marriage there okay all right now let's talk about the marriage license so a marriage license is issued by the local civil registrar of the city or municipality where either contracting party habitually resides. 
upon application separately filed by the parties okay so um, if the couple or if the uh, partners live in different cities so they can do they can choose just one city where to apply for a marriage license but uh, they have to file their separate applications for marriage license now the local civil registrar shall verify the legal capacity of the parties by requiring their birth certificates or their baptismal certificate in case the birth certificate cannot be uh, presented and if applicable proof that a previous marriage has been terminated by death or by a judicial decree Okay, so in case the cause or the ground for terminating the first marriage is death then uh, the applicant must present a copy of the death certificate of the dead spouse now in case of an annulment or nullity of marriage or even a divorce obtained abroad then a judicial decree in the annulment or in the nullity case or a judicial decree in the action for recognition or enforcement of the foreign divorce decree Okay, now in case of a foreigner applicant he she must also submit a certificate of legal capacity from his own uh, consular uh, or embassy office or diplomatic office consular or diplomatic office okay now let's talk about parental consent or advice which is of course related to the marriage license because without this uh, parental consent or advice the marriage license may or may not be issued okay now parental or guardian's consent is required if the contracting party is between the age of 18 and 21 years without that parental consent the marriage license will not be issued okay so it's mandatory okay it's not even discretionary on the part of the local civil registrar if there is no marriage or if there is no parental or guardian's consent and uh, the applicant for marriage license is between the age of 18 and 21 the uh, local civil registrar will not issue the marriage license okay next in case of a parental or guardian's consent okay, it is required if the contracting party is between the age of 21 and 25 if there is no such advice then the marriage the issuance of the marriage license shall be suspended until after three months following the publication of the application by posting for at least 10 days okay 10 consecutive days okay at uh, a conspicuous place usually a bulletin board okay at the office of the local civil registrar now marriage counseling now marriage counseling is required whenever parental consent or parental advice is required Marriage counseling shall be conducted by the priest, imam, or minister authorized to solemnize marriage or a government accredited marriage counselor. Okay? So remember who can uh, conduct marriage license and when, sorry, marriage counseling and who or when is marriage counseling required. Okay? Now, if no certificate of marriage counseling is submitted by the parties, then the marriage license will not be issued until after three months following the publication of the application for marriage license now so there are, there are now two instances when uh, the issuance of the marriage license may be suspended so first is when uh, there is no parental consent when parental consent is required or when there is no marriage counseling when marriage counseling is required now the reason according to many authors is that this is to allow at least the period uh, this is to allow the parties to uh, relatedly comply that's number one number two also this is to allow uh, the parties to really think think uh, the marriage over and see if they really are ready to marry considering that they didn't have the or didn't get the uh, parental advice or the marriage counseling the parental consent parental advice and marriage counseling are all geared or meant to make this couple you know mentally emotionally and psychologically prepared okay to marry okay now what is the validity of a marriage license a marriage license is valid for 120 days after its issuance so that's 120 divided by 30 days so that's four months okay from the issuance so um, 
a lot of couples usually uh, apply for a marriage license and then make preparations later okay so that's fine for as long as they make use of that marriage license within okay four months now also a marriage license is valid to be used anywhere in the philippines so they could get the marriage license from the place where they actually reside or one of them actually resides and uh, have the marriage ceremony at a different place where none of them resides that's fine because the marriage license is valid anywhere in the philippines now upon the expiration of the 120 day period okay that marriage license becomes inexistent or void in other words it can no longer be used so if they were married using an expired marriage license that marriage is void okay all right now what are the exemptions from the marriage license requirement or who are the persons who need not get a marriage license and just go ahead and then get married okay well assuming that of course all the other requisites are present okay this, we are only talking about the exemption from the marriage license requirement so first in case or both of the contracting parties are at the point of death well clearly because they're at the point of death they don't have time to go and apply for a marriage license okay in fact when they're at the point of death they really don't have time to prepare for anything else they just want to get married okay so that they can be married in the afterlife okay next is if the residence of either party is so located that there is no means of transportation to enable such party to appear personally before the local civil registrar that's also an exemption so for example uh, the couples are in the mountains and it's so hard to reach or it's so hard for them to go personally to the local civil registrar then they can marry there but of course they have to execute an affidavit okay to attest to the fact that they are in fact located in a very remote place and there is no um, transportation there is no there are no means of transportation okay next marriages among muslims or among members of the ethnic cultural communities well this is of course uh, uh, understandable because they have a different you know right or they have a different process of marrying so they don't need to get a marriage license but if they do get a marriage license that's fine okay it doesn't mean that uh, marriages among Muslims are absolutely exempted okay um, this is a privilege given to Muslims and other members of ethnic cultural communities that they may not need apply uh, marriage license but again as i said they 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 could still apply and uh, that's fine in fact that's even better because that would mean that they had complied with uh, the requirements especially regarding the verification of their age their legal capacity and all that okay and also if they are between the age of 18 and 21 plus between 21 and 25 then they will also have to submit parental consent or parental advice as the case may be as well as undergo marriage counseling so at least um, you know compliance redundancy is so much better than of course going through the shortcuts now speaking of shortcuts the last one is uh, the most interesting the most um, uh, common uh, exemption for applying for marriage license in fact i know of a couple who did not apply for a marriage license because they were already living together as husband and wife okay for at least five years so again uh the exemption is that in case the man and woman have lived together as husband and wife for at least five years and without legal impediment to marry each other okay so hindi pwede dito yung kabit hindi pwede dito yung mga uh, persons who are in an extramarital affair okay so they cannot uh, you know get married and then uh, use this ground as an exemption from the marriage license because they cannot be married okay, in the first place okay now let's talk about some cases on the marriage license requirement okay the first case is Alcantara versus Alcantara GR number 1677746 dated august 28 2007 
So the issuance of a marriage license in a city or municipality, not the residence of either of the contracting parties. And issuance of a marriage license despite the absence of publication, which is the 10 days of posting, or prior to the completion of the 10-day period for publication are considered mere irregularities that do not affect the validity of the marriage. So in this case, there is still a marriage license issued. It's just that it was irregularly issued. So an irregularity in any of the formal requisites of marriage does not affect its validity, but the party or parties responsible for the irregularity are civilly, criminally, and administratively liable. Okay, but then that's personal to them. That will not affect the marriage between the spouses. Okay, but take note of this next case. And the case is De Castro versus De Castro, GR number 160172, dated February 13, 2008. Now, the falsity of the affidavit cannot be considered as a mere irregularity in the formal requisites of marriage. By the way, what affidavit are we talking about? This is the affidavit in support of the last exemption from the marriage license, and that is the uh, living in together for at least five years. Okay, remember that? All right, there you go. At least five years. So, in order to avail of that exemption, they have to execute an affidavit, and that affidavit is also submitted to the local civil registrar together with the marriage certificate. So here, the affidavit was false, at least the fact that they were living together as husband and wife for at least five years, that never happened. So here, the Supreme Court said that the law dispenses with the marriage license requirement for a man and a woman who have lived together and exclusively with each other's husband and wife for a continuous and unbroken period of at least five years before the marriage. Now, the false affidavit which petitioner and respondent executed so they could push through with the marriage has no value whatsoever. It is a mere scrap of paper. They were not exempt from the marriage license requirement. Their failure to obtain and present a marriage license renders their marriage void ab initio. Okay, this is not just an irregularity, uh, the false affidavit in support of the exemption, but rather this goes into the requisite or the requirement of marriage license. Since they did not have a ground for exemption, then their contracting a marriage without a marriage license is void. Okay, or is uh, you know seriously infirm all right now let's talk about mixed marriages what are these mixed marriages well a mixed marriage is a marriage between a Filipino citizen and a foreigner whether celebrated here or abroad it is called a mixed marriage because of the presence of a foreign element and that foreign element is of course the foreign nationality of one of the parties to the marriage now, of course, if the marriage is between two Filipinos, it's not a mixed marriage, but rather it's a Filipino marriage. And even if the marriage was celebrated abroad, it will still remain a Filipino marriage because the parties are Filipinos. Okay, it's not a mixed marriage. Now, about mixed marriages, we have the following rules on validity. First is the rule on extrinsic validity. And the, intrins the extrinsic validity of a mixed marriage is governed by Lex Loci or Lex Loci Celebrationis. So what is Lex Loci or Lex Loci Celebrationis? It means law of the place where the contract was celebrated, and in this case, where the marriage was celebrated. So if it is valid in the place where it was celebrated, then it is valid here in the Philippines. Okay. Now, extrinsic validity refers to formalities or formal requisites. So, what are these formal requisites? Remember, first is the marriage license, authority of the solemnizing officer, and the marriage ceremony. So, to better understand this, let's let's imagine a situation. Let's say um, a Filipino or a Filipina met a foreigner. Let's say uh, a European, what country? Let's say Austrian. Okay, so he's an Austrian from Austria. Okay, not Australia, but Austria in Europe. Okay, now uh, they were married in Austria, 
Okay, so the Filipina went to uh, Austria and she got married to the Austrian boyfriend. So there, the requirement was just simply filing an application, submitting an ID. But of course, I'm just guessing. No? What if that that were just the requirements? So their law there is different from our law. Our law would have also required, uh, let's say, uh, the authority of the solemnizing officer. So we have very specific persons who can solemnize an author. Uh, 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 or consolidate a marriage and also a marriage ceremony where the parties will take each other's husband and wife before the solemnizing officer now let's say um, the marriage was was just a photo finish kind of marriage where they would just go to an office uh, file an application submit their ID and it sign that document and then voila they are married now if that happened here in the philippines that would be a void marriage because it did not meet all the formal requisites it lacked the solemnizing officer and there was also no marriage ceremony but then again we have lex laws and celebrationis so if that marriage is valid in austria then it is valid here in the philippines again because it goes into the formal requisites only so when we speak of formal requisites we apply Lex Loci Celebrationis. Okay. All right. Now, next, intrinsic validity, okay, is governed by the national law of the parties. Intrinsic validity goes into the essential requisites of marriage, such as legal capacity and consent. Thus, if the Filipino spouse was a minor at the time of the marriage, the marriage is void even if at the place of celebration of the marriage a minor may marry so for example uh, there is this country let's say it in africa where uh, a, a child yes well technically that person would still be a child let's say the child is just 14 years old and in that uh, country a 14 year old can now can can marry and uh, here you have a minor more than 14 years old uh, who went to that country in Africa and uh, he or she was married there even if that marriage is valid there as far as the extrinsic validity is concerned but this marriage is void because it is intrinsically invalid why because as far as intrinsic validity is concerned we apply the national or the personal law of the parties to the marriage and here you have a Filipino and his national law, of course, is composed of the Family Code uh, plus Republic Act 6809, which states that okay, the age of majority is 18 years old and thus only persons uh, above the age of 18 or 18 and above can marry. And that law is a law on status and it follows a Filipino wherever he may be found. Okay. All right, so that is the difference between extrinsic validity and intrinsic validity as they apply to mixed marriages. All right, now, mixed marriages are prone to, of course, divorces, okay? Because I think divorce is really normal, okay, to uh, foreigners, okay? Now, for, unfortunately for us, you know, divorce is a no-no, okay? But what if the divorce uh, is obtained by the foreigner spouse or even the Filipino spouse well article 26 second paragraph of the family code provides that where a marriage between a Filipino citizen and a foreigner is validly celebrated and a divorce is thereafter validly obtained abroad by the alien spouse capacitating him or her to remarry the Filipino spouse shall likewise have capacity to remarry under Philippine law okay so Let's let's first dissect Article Twenty Six, Second Paragraph. So first, the marriage is a mixed marriage. It's a mixed one because it's a marriage between a Filipino citizen and a foreigner. Okay. Now that a divorce is thereafter obtained abroad by the alien spouse, okay, which capacitates him to remarry. If that happens, then the Filipino spouse will also be capacitated to remarry under the Philippines. Okay, so from the simple reading of the case or from the simple reading of this provision, 
clearly it would appear that only one party can obtain okay, the divorce. Okay? And who is that party? Well, it's the foreigner spouse. So the former interpretation or the interpretation for the longest time, I think since from uh, since since 1988 when the family code was of course promulgated, the interpretation was that it should be the foreigner spouse who had obtained the divorce. If it was the Filipino spouse who secured the divorce, then Article 26 is not applicable and the divorce obtained by the Filipino spouse will not capacitate him to remarry under Philippine law. Okay, but then came Republic versus Manalo, okay, last April 24, 2018. So the new rule now is that a Filipino citizen has the capacity to remarry under Philippine law after initiating a divorce proceeding abroad and obtaining a favorable judgment against his or her alien spouse who is capacitated to remarry. So in this case, the Philippine spouse who was married to a Japanese national in the Philippines obtained a divorce in Japan and after that filed a petition in the Philippines to have her marriage certificate cancelled. So. In this case, the Supreme Court said that there seems to be no uh, wise reason or justification for limiting Article 26 only to the foreigner spouse, meaning to say to a, to a situation where only the foreigner spouse can uh, obtain the divorce because the divorce abroad whether it was initiated by the foreigner or by the Filipina would still capacitate the foreigner spouse to remarry but then uh, for the Filipina spouse she would he or she would only be able to remarry if it was the foreigner who uh, uh, initiated or who obtained the divorce decree if she or he if the Filipino spouse initiated it only the foreigner spouse will benefit from that and be able to marry again but then this Filipino who obtained that divorce cannot under Philippine law so there is an invalid justification there so that's why the Supreme Court said following the equal protection clause of the Constitution there should be no discrimination okay or there should be no uh, variation okay as far as or variance as far as the treatment of the law I mean why prefer a foreigner and then you know leave the Filipino uh, at a very disadvantaged situation all right so that is now the the ruling or that is now the interpretation of article 26 of the family code but take note that this is not automatic okay there must be a process called enforcement or recognition of a foreign divorce before that Filipino spouse can remarry under Philippine law. His failure to have that uh, divorce decree recognized here prior to marrying again would of course make him criminally liable for bigamy because at the time of the second marriage a validly existing or subsisting marriage okay uh, is still recorded in the Philippine Statistics Authority or the local civil registrar. Now, for the procedure uh, for the enforcement of foreign decree, um, we have had several cases now decided by the Supreme Court, including uh, the case of Fujiki uh, and all that. So, you, you just research on those cases, especially those cases under your conflict of laws subject. All right. Okay, now. Let's go to the questions which I posed early on. So to the first question, if marriage is statutorily defined and regulated, can the legislature then change the nature and dynamics of marriage, like allowing divorce, even if that goes against tradition, norms, and religious beliefs? Well, you see, well, first, the answer is yes, you know, a big yes. The fate of marriage really rests on the hands of our lawmakers okay um, marriage while uh, perceived as a union blessed by the church or blessed by God is really at the mercy of our legislators and so if the legislators want to change the dynamics 
or the um, requisites or even the the nature the very nature of marriage from permanent to temporary and if it is approved by the president then that will change the landscape okay for the legal landscape for marriage you see um, we have marriage as uh, or we, we, we see marriage both as a spiritual thing as well as a non non sectarian thing okay it's a spiritual thing because marriage is as old as religion itself in fact uh, religion propagated because of marriage uh, human population boom because of marriage and so it has been perceived as you know as a spiritual thing one that we do in honor of or by virtue of the orders of God okay but the thing is marriage is governed by law and so because it's governed by law then it can be changed we can have that that possibility in the future of divorce in the Philippines and it is within the power of the legislature to allow divorce notwithstanding the fact that marriage is a permanent union under the Bible or under the Quran well definitely not under the Quran because Quran allows divorce but uh, also morally speaking people would say that you know a couple should should stay together till death do them part but then again you know marriage is really you know drafted and created by law so if it can be created by law it can also be destroyed by law okay? for the lack of a better term all right okay next with the present covid-19 pandemic where video conferencing has substituted most face-to-face -face activities like meetings classes and even court hearings can we allow a marriage ceremony through video conferencing well again because the law makes it very clear that uh, the husband and wife should declare or should give their consent you know in the presence of the solemnizing officer in a marriage ceremony for the purpose then uh, video conferencing would not be allowed because video conferencing is not physical presence but okay considering that you know with technology with uh, the advances of technology you know virtual presence is almost like physical presence because you can interact with another person Okay, through uh, video conferencing or video chat as if that person is right there in front of you I don't see uh, any reason to uh, you know prevent the possibility of a marriage ceremony through video conferencing what is important is that we should have a law okay, to allow it because we have of course the family code which you know strictly uh, contemplates marriage as a physical thing or as a physical event but it can be allowed it may be allowed but by uh, or but through a legislative measure okay you know we have to be realistic we have to be in touch with reality especially now but you know I've heard or I, I learned several months back that uh, a bill has been uh, filed before the House of Representatives to allow uh, marriage by video conferencing but unfortunately I don't have any update on that but that would be a good measure especially because you know uh, social distancing and because we want to you know stop the spread of the coronavirus and you know how it is here in the Philippines you know marriage is really a, is really a big family or barangay affair you know? so that would mean you know people congregating uh, people laughing people you know, cheering and talking too close to one another so there is a risk of spreading the virus but then even after the uh, this pandemic I think video conferencing or marriage by video conferencing should still stay or should still be allowed because of you know the possibility that the spouses are in two different places but then they just uh, want to go through that ceremony to to formalize their union or maybe to legitimize a child and all that 
You see, uh, marriage, while it is a personal affair, may also affect the status of other person. So, allowing it for the benefit of that other person would be a noble purpose. Alright? Okay, next. If an 18-year-old has legal capacity, including the capacity to enter into onerous contracts like sales, loans, and mortgages, why does an 18-year-old need parental consent? Or a 21-year-old need parental advice to marry? Isn't this an unwarranted restriction to legal capacity? Well, good observation. Okay. Why? Because if you will remember on the law on persons, especially on the law on capacity, capacity is acquired upon the attainment of the age of 18. And once a person is 18 years old, um, he can, for all intents and purposes, enter into any contract, okay? whether uh, this is a, a gratuitous contract, like a waiver, or uh, an onerous contract such as sales, loans, and mortgages. And it should be the same, you know, for marriage. You know, if you're an 18 year old, then you should be considered old enough to know what you're getting into, because part of capacity is what we call competence or comprehension, and this is the ability to understand the consequences of your actions. And uh, if you enter into a contract of sale as a buyer, of course you understand the consequence of your being a buyer, and that is to pay for uh, to pay the purchase price. And uh, same with mortgage. If you enter into a mortgage, even if you're 18 years old, you are deemed to know that you know failing to pay the principal loan will result in the foreclosure of the mortgage. No parental guidance, no parental consent or advice needed there. Okay, but then marriage seems to be a different thing. Well, of course, as I've said, this is a special contract. But then again, if an 18 year old is allowed to enter into onerous contracts like sales, loan or property or mortgage where default could result in the loss of property and lots of money, then uh, he should be considered to be able to understand the consequences of marriage, right? Okay, right. But, again, as you have said, um, marriage is a special contract. And what is more, ours is a very unique situation. You see, marriage is a family affair. And so, uh, a person aged 18 to 21 or 21 to 25 may still be considered so young and uh, just slightly much mature and thus he would still need some guidance from elder people who have had the chance to go through the difficulties as well as the fun times of marriage and you see a young person who is so in love and who is so excited to you know to live with with uh, another person in marriage may not be able to foresee or to understand uh, the other side of marriage and that is the hardships and the challenges of marriage so the families of both spouses would want them to be ready for that and it would be the height of what negligence or neglect as a parent if you don't give the proper advice to your child who is about to get married okay so i think that's deeply rooted into our culture so that's why we have this requirement okay and uh, also the second reason is that because marriage is a permanent union there is really no way getting out of it okay unless of course the, the unless of course the parties or one of the parties has died or in case the marriage is voidable or void ab initio but other than that there is no way of ending that marriage so the parties must have all the support all the advice they can get prior to getting married it's not about curtailing their independence, but it's about giving them that needed or that required support or advice so that they know what they're getting into 
and that uh, there can be no you know blaming uh, done when of course that marriage fails or when the couple wanted to separate so they cannot say ah hindi kasi ako na advisean or hindi ko kasi alam ano pinapasok ko diba? with all the advice from both parents okay? not just the advice but even the consent I think they cannot say they did not understand or they were not ready to get into the marriage in the first place alright now last question why do people fall in love why do they fall out of love why do people marry why do they want to unmarry does the law have the answers to these questions unfortunately no okay the law our lawmakers not even the courts have the answers to these questions that's why marriage remains to be the most hard to understand phenomenon of human life you see uh, it's not just about mating it's not just about reproduction it's not just about procreation also marriage is not just about having a companion marriage is a commitment but as a commitment it's not perfect and so we try to legislate matters of the heart we try to legislate matters of what companionship but then no two people are alike and even if they are alike they will still go through some disagreements i mean twins mostly you know uh disagree so uh if twins can disagree how much more uh, two different people who are just bonded because of some physical urge or sexual desire towards one another right so that's the problem the law cannot fully understand the reasons for people or the reasons of people when they fall in love or when they fall out of love or when people marry or when they want to unmarry and this must be something that our legislators and everyone else including the church including lawyers including judges including ordinary citizens must understand and so if we are to make marriage work or if we are to make people happy we must have an open mind about marriage okay the formula uh for some couples may not work for other couples there is no strict and uniform you know rule or uniform formula for every couple Okay, so that's why uh, the law fails when it is insensitive okay, to the problems or the concerns of married couples. By using the same formula for everybody, okay, we are denying the reality that couples, more so individuals, are never the same. Okay, so that's the point. That's my point. And so uh, moving forward... And our marriage laws should be treated with an open mind and so if there are some suggestions or there are some proposals these proposals must be taken in the context of providing those individuals or those people who are not happy in their marriage or whose marriages have become prisons for them okay because marriage is supposed to be a beautiful thing but then when it ceases or when it fails to give that bliss then there must be something wrong but if our law prevents them or deprives them of an opportunity to better their lives then the law is failing them that's my point the law can never understand why people fall in love why people fall out of love while people marry or why people want to unmarry okay all right so that's it for me thank you very much for watching and for listening i hope you learned something today there will still be more videos coming up so just stay tuned so by the way you can follow me on facebook my facebook page is attorney al jumrani and of course this is my youtube channel the house of law so please uh, drop a like if you enjoyed this video 
please subscribe to my channel to support me and with that i'll see you in the next video bye